Good morning, and welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. It's really my pleasure today to introduce two star associate professors in our department. Uh, they're both tremendously accomplished um, and um, could take 15 minutes to introduce individually, but I'm not going to do that. Um, interestingly, I can do a bit of a combined um, introduction. Dr. Amy Kind and Dr. Ann Sheehy were both born in Wisconsin, raised in Wisconsin, uh, Dr. Kind in Niagara near the UP and Dr. Sheehy here in Middleton. Uh, they both graduated from college in 1996. Uh, first, Dr. Kind uh, graduated from the University of Wisconsin uh, for her undergrad in molecular biology and then from the School of Medicine uh, following that. She did residency at the Massachusetts General Hospital, then came back for fellowship in geriatrics in older women's health and population sciences um, in, from 2005 onward. Along the way, she obtained a PhD in population health sciences. She has served as a clinical instructor and then a CHS assistant professor before switching to the tenure track and uh, ascending to become a, um, an associate professor with tenure in 2015. She's um, the founding director of the UW Department of Medicine Health Services and Care Research Program. I'm limiting myself to condensing the achievements of these two uh, distinguished physician scientists, uh, but she is best known for designing and testing system, systems interventions that improve care and are particularly applicable to low resource and safety net hospital settings. And more recently, she is a world renowned expert on the impact of neighborhood disadvantage on health, uh, specifically publishing her work on the neighborhood atlas in the New England Journal just within the last couple of months that was tweeted out by Francis Collins among others. Uh, I'm limiting the honors listed today, uh, but um, of note, she received the UW-Madison Campus-Wide Health and Society Research Prize from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in 2015, and even greater honor, the Pusto Research Award from the Department of Medicine in that same year. Now on to Dr. Sheehy. She graduated from Stanford for her undergrad and then Mayo for her MD. After a bit of a detour studying OBGYN at UT Southwestern, I don't know what you were thinking, Ann. The, um, she uh, found her calling in internal medicine and undertook her residency at the Osler service at the Johns Hopkins University Department of Medicine. Along the way, she's obtained an MS in clinical research. Like uh, Dr. Kine, she found her way to a tenure track uh, even more circuitously, perhaps. She became a clinical assistant professor and served in that role till 2011. Along the way, as a clinical assistant professor, I recruited her to become the division head for the Division of Hospital Medicine. She then switched, uh, and she then uh, became a clinical associate professor and then did a track switch to CHS and then subsequently did a track switch in the integrated pathway to become a tenured associate professor um, in the School of Medicine and Public Health and she continues as the head of the Division of Hospital Medicine. Her area of science and national prominence is in um, the complex world of, of actual health care, hospitalization versus observation, and, and this has a phenomenal impact on our patients and health policy. And because of that insight, she's been an invited participant at a press conference in D.C. about this, um, she's been an invited witness to the Senate House Ways and Means Health Subcommittee, an invited witness to the Senate Special Committee on Aging, and the Senate Finance Committee, really representing uh, us and our state on the national arena, and again, limiting her to only two awards. She's received the Department of Medicine Grossman Professionalism Award in 2014, and the Society of Hospital Medicine National Award for Outstanding Service to hospital medicine. Um, the rest of this is all up to them. They've got a presentation that's, that, that I know will be enlightening and important. And please join me as we welcome uh, 
Dr. Kind and Dr. Sheehy as they present Grand Rounds. Well, thank you all so much. It's an absolute honor to be here talking to you today. Thank you to Dean Page for the wonderful introduction. Uh, and most of all, thank you to Dr. Sheehy for co-presenting with me. We truly are saving the best for last, so I will be going first, and then Anne will come, be coming after me. First of all, some disclosures and a roadmap. So, so we'll be talking about health services and care research. What is health, services, is health services and care research and why is it important? I'll be providing you with a little bit of an overview of some of the new resources available through the Department of Medicine. And then we'll be highlighting two programs that are ongoing in health services, health services and care research here. Of course, there are many, many wonderful programs in our department in this area. So this is just to give you a small taste. Uh, first, we'll be talking about some social determinants of health work that I do, and then Anne will be offering her wonderful work on Medicare observation stays. If I am successful today, you'll learn more about the field, and perhaps I'll attract some of you, will attract some of you into the field. So if you're a trainee, a junior faculty, an established faculty, think about this area and think about the impact you could potentially have, uh, and please come talk to us. So first of all, why is health services and care research important? Well, you've all seen slides like this. The health care costs growth within our country are unsustainable. We are spending more money on health care than any other country within the world. In fact, the percentage of GDP projected in 2020 is, is going to be almost 20% for our United States. 20% of our entire gross domestic product will be going towards health care. And yet, despite this high price tag, our outcomes are not all that great. I could show you many, many slides demonstrating this, but this is the difference in life expectancy by race and gender. And for those of you that can't see the words on this slide, let me tell you that African Americans live significantly shorter lives on average than Caucasians. They also have, we have discrepancies and disparities and issues with health equity across our country in many different ways. We have many, many wonderful treatments in the U.S. We have treatments for hypertension, treatments for hypercholesterolemia. We know how to counsel people to help them stop smoking, and yet we still have challenges in translating these findings into the real world. This is a recent slide that's been put forward by the American Heart Association showing that we have 34 million with uncontrolled hypertension, th another 35 million with uncontrolled hy hypercholesterolemia, 215 million overconsume, 124 million underexert, and almost 37 million still smoke. So even though we have these treatments, we know what to do, how do we translate them in the real world to show real world change? In the late 1990s and the early 2000s, the Institute of Medicine took on some of these challenges and published two landmark books. The first was To Air as Human. And in this uh, study, it offered many, many different points, but perhaps the most profound was that nearly 100,000 people die in U.S. hospitals annually due to our own, our own processes, due to medical error. Right on the heels of that, they published Crossing the Quality Chasm, which was and still is a guidepost towards trying to improve the healthcare system within our country. Some of the challenges that were highlighted by the Institute of Medicine included patient safety, effectiveness and timeliness of our care, patient-centeredness, efficiency, and equity throughout our healthcare system. So how do we approach these things? How do we fix these problems? Uh, this is where health services and care research comes in. The nation's healthcare delivery has fallen far short in its ability to translate knowledge into practice, says the IOM. And so health services and care research is a multidisciplinary field of scientific investigation that studies how social factors, financing systems, organizational structures and processes, health technologies, personal behaviors affect access to health care, the quality and cost of care, and ultimately our health and well-being. Its research is incredibly broad and has domains which include individuals, families, organizations, communities, and populations. 
But ultimately, the goal of health services and care research is to provide information that will eventually lead to improvements in the health of the citizenry. If we think about this on the translational research spectrum, you can think of basic science at the, at the very far end, the discovery science. This is our wonderful bench research um, that goes on where we can learn more about the basic fundamental biophysiology of the human and uh, of life and moving to translation to the bedside. But then as we translate to phase three trials, to practices and to the real world, this type two through type four research, these are the domains of the health services and care researcher. So it is a very broad field. And it's a field that as compared to basic biosciences is relatively young. And yet it is growing in importance and growing in funding. Traditionally, often for health services research, we think of AHRQ or PCORI as being the major funders, but dollars-wise, NIH provides more money to health services and care research than any other institute, any other body, federal body. Uh, and the Department of Veterans Affairs has been funding this type of research for the longest. So it is something that's quite fundable. I myself get all, virtually all of my funding from the NIH, and uh, it's something that continues to grow. So in this venue of the growing importance of health services research, the Health Services and Care Research Program was established through the Department of Medicine. And the mission of this program is to improve health and quality of life of patients and caregivers within Wisconsin and beyond. We perform high impact transformational research on care policy processes and outcomes, do rigorous development, testing, and dissemination of pioneering medical care models, and invest in the HSR career development of our faculty, affiliates, and trainees to promote continued growth and success. But this is a community effort, and we are governed by an executive committee who you can see here. I'm sure you know many of these smiling faces. Anne is on our executive committee. In addition, Dr. Christy Bartles, Dr. Nasia Safdar, and Dr. Uh, Bill Ellenbach. Uh, the executive committee provides program vision and oversight, resource management, including reviewing requests, and support um, and consultation for different programs that might come forward, grant ideas, analytic strategy, or papers in process. We have monthly seminars. We just had one on Monday. And I would encourage you to come and join us for these. These are wonderful opportunities to hear about what's going on in your very own department in this area. Our next seminar is November 19th with Dr. Christy Bartles and Dr. Ann Chadra talking about lupus, rehospitalizations, and Medicare. And then December 17th, we have Mike Fiore um, talking about treating tobacco dependence and HSR for that domain. We will continue having monthly seminars throughout the rest of the academic year and do provide, as I said, additional mentoring for trainees. So if you're an early career person, please come and join us. But we also have resources available for those of you who are interested in doing more research in this area, including uh, uh, world-renowned, actually nationally renowned Medicare data resources. We have 100% Medicare data file, including 59 million subjects that's fully geolinked. I'll show you why the geolinkage is important in a moment. We also have core research staff with a number of different um, uh, technical and uh, scientific expertise areas and information systems that allow for security, secure storage, storage and um, large data processing abilities. So we have this wonderful infrastructure, we have these wonderful, these wonderful uh, approaches coming forward. So what can we do with this? What are some example uh, different uh, areas of research that could go forward in this domain using some of the resources here? Well, first, I will tell you a little bit about our work in the social determinants of health. So this is something that's very close to my heart. Um, we can improve health here. We do a, actually a really great job of improving health in places like this. We have great technology. We have great pharmacotherapeutics. Uh, we have great health programs. But we don't do as good of a job as a country improving health in places that look like this. In fact, I would argue that this is one of the most profound and important questions of our generation, that how do we improve health in places that look like this? And for me, this is particularly important because where I grew up looked a lot more like those second pictures than it did the first. And so the overarching program goal of my research is to develop practical approaches towards the elimination of health disparities and the promotion of health equity. 
We know that many diseases, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, COPD, they disproportionately impact racial and ethnic minorities and the socioeconomically disadvantaged. These are populations that are more apt to live in disadvantaged neighborhoods like the pictures I just showed, showed you. When you live in a place like that, when you live in these disadvantaged neighborhoods, you're much more apt to have difficulties with exposures to toxins. You may not be in a safe environment. You might have trouble accessing healthy food and health behaviors, the things we counsel patients to do, exercise, eat healthy, stop smoking, they become much, much harder. So this, where you live, neighborhood disadvantage, it's a social determinant of health. And it's been recognized as a social determinant of health for a long time. But it's something that we within the health community maybe don't talk about quite that much. But we do know from many decades of research, primarily from sociology, that living in a disadvantaged U.S. neighborhood is strongly linked to increased mortality and disease. Context, this idea of context, neighborhood context, it's fundamental to almost any mechanistic theory of health disparities. I'm just showing you one example here. This is a very busy slide, but this is the theory that's officially adopted by the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. And one of the things to note is that context, community, and society make up a huge portion of this interlinking model and expand across the life course. So context is important in health. High quality studies also suggest that where you live operates independently of your individual socioeconomics in terms of your health. So another way of saying this is if you are poor, it is better to live in a, in a less disadvantaged neighborhood, in a well-off neighborhood, than it is for you to be in a highly disadvantaged neighborhood. If you are poor and living in a highly disadvantaged neighborhood, your health is more apt to be quite, quite worse. Health interventions and policies that don't account for neighborhood disadvantage might be ineffective. So if you're counseling a patient about insulin and you're hoping, talking to them about their diabetes and healthy eating, but they're homeless and they don't have access to a refrigerator, that counseling is probably not all that helpful. You need to think about these larger social contexts. And yet within research and within much of our policy, that vision is not always there. So much of the research in this area relies on something called geospatial analytics in order to take the concepts that we showed you in those pictures, this idea of the challenged neighborhood, and to translate into a, that into a number so that we can think about targeting and think about application for research purposes. But it's a highly specialized field. We've been very fortunate to have those kinds of resources here at the University of Wisconsin, but they're not widely available in all places of the U.S. or even within all academic centers. So neighborhood factors are not typically incorporated into existing NIH research data or even other population factors. So where you live impacts your health and what can we do about this? Well, these metrics of neighborhood disadvantage really have a lot of potential. They're very robust. If we could only access them, if we could only use them, they could be applied to a whole host of things. They are generalizable to the full U.S. and Puerto Rico. They can be incorporated into statistical models and facilitate mechanistic science. They're privacy compliant. We can share them easily across a web. We don't have to worry about protected health information. And they have a really strong track, app, track record of application in health policy abroad, primarily in places like Sweden, the Netherlands, and the U.K. They're translatable. You can, you can act upon them at a policy level, at an individual level. They can guide outreach and targeting through mapping. They can influence intervention design. You can think about the way you address diabetes, for instance, in disadvantaged areas differently in other, than in other areas. And they're policy applicable. And yet, as I said, they're underutilized. So into this, we thought that there was a lot of potential for these metrics, and we targeted something called the Area Deprivation Index, which was a metric originally developed by the Health Services and Care, Res uh, excuse me, Health, Health Resources and Services Administration nearly three decades ago, so back in the 1980s and 1990s. And it was employed at the county level to, to, to look at um, associations between mortality and disadvantage. So many of the landmark studies that looked at the fact that disadvantaged areas were more apt to have uh, deaths due to trauma or deaths due to cancer came from some of this work in the 1980s. This metric includes 17 different measures of education, employment, housing, and poverty. And they were originally drawn from the long-form census. So it had a lot of potential, but it needed, a, needed quite a bit of updating to make it useful in this day and age. So we received a, a grant from the National Institutes of Minority Health and Health Disparities to do just that. 
We took this metric and we updated it to much more recent data sources, which took some time. We also refined it down to, some, to the census block group level instead of the county level. This is a very geographically discrete level. I'll show you some pictures of that in a moment. And then we've been working for the last five to seven years to validate these efforts. So when you think of the typical geopolitical boundaries that we see every day, these are counties. Often much of the contextual uh, disparities work that's done in this field focuses on the county. Uh, these are counties obviously within Wisconsin. The dark blue are the most disadvantaged and the light blue are the least disadvantaged. But I hope you know from practicing in Dane County, for, as, for many of you for many, many years, that there are areas in Dane County that are pockets of extreme disadvantage that don't show up on this map. And also within Milwaukee, there are pockets of extreme wealth that don't show up. But when we take things down to the census block group level or the neighborhood level, you can see a much more um, uh, kind of uh, uh, discrete map that comes forward. Uh, we have a tapestry of disadvantage that, that extends and, and, and doesn't necessarily follow these geopolitical boundaries. Uh, on this map, the red areas are the most disadvantaged and the blue areas are the least disadvantaged. And this color coding scheme will continue through all the maps that I show you today. So as you can see, the, the areas of disadvantage are not just within the Madison, the Dane County area or the Milwaukee area, but also within the northern communities uh, and the, particularly the Native American communities within our state. If we were to zoom into Milwaukee for a moment, you can see that the pattern of disadvantage in Milwaukee is not uniform. In fact, not surprisingly, along the lakeshore, we have some of the richest neighborhoods within the state, probably because they're big homes and beautiful places. But the inner city core is profoundly disadvantaged. So by having this more discrete uh, ability to target outreach and to think about the exposure of different patients within different areas, it allows us to be much more precise in terms of policy, intervention, and research. But the power here is we can do this for the entire United States. We can do this for every city, every county, every state. So what, how has this been used so far? Well, we have been sharing data w widely with collaborators across the United States, and they have linked uh, neighborhood disadvantage to things like rehospitalization and cost. Here with our, within our own center, we've looked at 80 uh, Alzheimer's disease-specific biomarkers of disease, including cognitive loss and hippocampal volumes. Uh, we've linked this to skin infection and deafness in childhood with some investigators at Duke. I've been working with groups from Brown to look at Medicare Advantage plan performance and how uh, different metrics of quality could be influenced by where a, where a Medicare Advantage plan actually is based. Uh, we've been working with groups from Maryland looking at functional loss in older adults within disadvantaged areas. Additionally, from a delivery perspective, CMS reached out to us and asked for these data in order to allow for better targeting of a diabetes education effort called the Everybody with Diabetes Counts program. And what this allows them to do is to be much more efficient with their ground operations so that they can look at these maps, find the areas that are most disadvantaged, and send their, their ground frontline providers directly to those areas to, to build collaborations and to reach persons that need, the, um, need intervention the most. And through that approach, their volumes have increased dramatically. Multiple state-based health organizations are already using these data to catalyze new partnerships amongst health systems, governments, and at, to advocate for policies addressing social factors that influence health. But ultimately, if we were to wait for everyone to come to us to the data, for the data, or wait for just those groups who had the geo or the analytic expertise to use such complex data, I didn't think that we would ultimately create real change. We needed to get this data out on a much broader scale because its potential is, as I said, I think is quite large. So we embrace this concept of data democratization. So what is that? So making complex data easily available to wide-reaching expert and non-expert audiences to massively broaden uptake and use of critical concepts and tools. This is extremely challenging to practically achieve due to technical challenges of big data. How do you make these things usable to someone without a high school education? But that was our goal. And this was the birth of the Neighborhood Atlas. 
So the Neighborhood Atlas lives here. It lives within the Department of Medicine. It's a free research tool which makes neighborhood disadvantage metrics available to all across the entire U.S. and Puerto Rico. You don't need a geoanalytics degree. If you can use a smartphone, you can use this atlas. It works just like Google Maps. Uh, and it allows for data downloads, including a crosswalk of approximately 70 million nine-digit zip codes, so that you can link these data metrics into almost any existing data repository that's available. This is a, just a quick shot of the atlas and the data downloads. But the most popular piece of this has been the mapping. So how can you map? Well, you can select a state. And it can allow for real-time mapping. This is obviously Maryland. But again, using this heat map type formulation, you can quickly see where the most disadvantaged areas are in Maryland. One can zoom in into a street level, and these street markings do show up. And then you can also think of these um, different types of maps from different vantage points. So this is Mississippi. And this is Mississippi as compared to Mississippi itself. So if we click this button, this is Mississippi as compared to just the other counties within Mississippi. Um, if I was interested in finding out where the most disadvantaged counties were in Mississippi, I can highlight this rainbow bar and just toggle over it, and it can show me where those are. But if I'm interested in Mississippi's uh, vantage point from the full nation, I can click this button, and you can see here. Obviously, highly, highly disadvantaged. So this work was published in the New England Journal uh, just two months ago. And since that time, we've had a, I, I just, I'm so pleased, we've had a, a, a very, very brisk response to the, to the web tool. So uh, as of two months ago, um, uh, we had 53,000 views. And we keep having very active traffic. Um, the vast majority of these are focused on mapping. Uh, as of the last time we quantified these data, we had 3,500 downloads already. Three quarters of those were outside academia, primarily to places like the Social Security Administration, NIH, CDC, VA, DOD, HHS, the U.S. House of Representatives. Many foundations like AARP have reached out to us and then industry, health systems, and others who are thinking about local level change. We've had more than 600 academic registered users representing 300 unique universities in 47 of the 50 states, uh, France, Netherlands, England, and Nigeria. I've presented on this work, this local level predictive analytics work to the NIH leadership at NHLBI, and we will be doing a full day uh, seminar and training to uh, the NIH in the spring. So what are the potentials here? Um, I, I personally, I'm obviously biased, but I, I think it, it could be huge. Um, what we hope to update the ADI every five years, and we do have the resources to do that, but I'm in conversations with the NIH to look for resources to update this annually. We're exploring offering additional measures on the atlas. I've been uh, talking to some people at the World Health Organization about pollution, um, air particulate measures that could potentially be put through this platform, again, to, to make them available to a wider research community. We're hoping to ca uh, catalyze translational research, including multi-stakeholder community intervention research to improve health, clinical trial and cohort recruitment. So if you're running a clinical trial and you want a more diverse and inclusive audience, perhaps we can use this as a tool to target outreach and to think about even now how diverse and inclusive our clinical trials data are. The world of epigenomics, the interface between social factors and genes and how genes are affected by our environment, uh, obviously could use this work as well. And I myself have funding to look at the sociobiological mechanisms of disease. So why do disparities happen at a fundamental level? Why does living in a disadvantaged area change the way your body processes um, the, physiology, the physiological processes in order to result in disease? Uh, there's lots to be done in combining basic science and social science here, and I think, I think we can do that using this. And so Barb Benlin and I received um, an RF1, a five-year RF1, to look at this process in Alzheimer's disease. But one could potentially do this in cancer, do this in rheumatoid arthritis, do this in a number of different areas, because we do know, as I said, many diseases, uh, the incidence of many diseases mirror disparities within our country, and it would be very interesting to know more about that. So that's the end of my portion. I am very, very pleased to be able to introduce Anne and have her come up and talk about her groundbreaking work in Medicare policy uh, on observation stays.
Thank you, Dr. Kahn, and I'm equally thrilled to be here today to talk about observation. So I'm going to follow this outline generally. And I wanted to just state up front that most of my points will refer to original Medicare. And some of them could be perceived as negative or critical of the program, but Medicare was created at a time when Americans under um, over age 65 were the most likely demographic to be living in poverty, and they were the most likely to, to lack health insurance. And so I really hope that you'll view my comments as aimed at improving a very important program in, the, in, the, in our country, one that maybe needs some updating 50 years later. So what is observation? Well, this is my first experience with observation, sometime back in 2010, and I was a hospitalist here, and I had a patient on my service who had a new diagnosis of cancer. And she had just undergone her first round of chemotherapy, and she was admitted with dehydration and some acute kidney injury, and she just wasn't making it at home. And I rounded on her for about three days, and I discussed her care with the physical therapist who I was working with, and the physical therapist and I agreed that she needed to go to a skilled nursing facility. I started talking to my case manager, and she said, well, Anne, she can't go. She's never been hospitalized as an inpatient. And I said, well, what do you mean? I've been rounding on her like all my other patients for the last three days. And it was my case manager that told me what observation was. And what this meant for my patient is that she had paid into the Medicare program her whole life, and when she needed her post-acute skilled nursing facility benefit the most, she wasn't eligible. And I thought if this was a problem for my patient, it was probably happening to more patients across the country, and we decided to study it. So just so everyone's on the same page, patients can be hospitalized as inpatients, and patients can be hospitalized as outpatients. And all patients hospitalized under observation are outpatients. Medicare patients hospitalized as inpatients are covered by Medicare Part A, hospital insurance. And Medicare will pay for post-discharge skilled nursing care if a patient stays three consecutive inpatient midnights and needs that benefit. The deductible this year is $1,340 per benefit period. Medicare patients hospitalized under observation are covered by Part B. They do not um, have eligibility for the skilled nursing facility benefit no matter how long they stay in the hospital, and they don't have coverage for self-administered drugs like their blood pressure medicine or their cholesterol medicine, those things that they would take at home. Now, Medicare Part D would cover those if the patient had that or other pharmacy coverage, but it's not covered under Part B. And there's this kind of strange way Medicare covers observation in the hospital. There's a limit um, that the patient may, won't pay more than $1,340 per service. So my patient won't pay more than $1,340 for that CAT scan, and they won't pay more than $1,340 for that x-ray. But there's no cumulative limit to the amount that a patient may pay out of pocket, which is obviously the only important thing in the eyes of the patient. So if that didn't make sense, this is the limit of my artistic ability here. Um, and this is a, a marked oversimplification of this, but along the x-axis you have the number of hypothetical services, and on the y-axis you have copay. And this green line here is the inpatient. That patient will never pay more than $1,340 this year for a benefit period. The observation patient, if they have a very simple hospitalization, they might pay less than the inpatient deductible. But as their hospitalization becomes more complicated and they need more services, at some point a threshold is reached and the observation patient pays more. And there is no limit to how far this line can go. I will just mention there's a new um, comprehensive ambulatory payment classification for observation services. And CAPC is kind of to DRG, so CAPC is kind of the outpatient model of that. However, we really don't know um, what impact this will have on the observation picture, but potentially could help some patients in capping that out-of-pocket risk. So who are these observation patients? Well, we did study this at University Hospital using our data from 2010 and 2011, and basically what we found was this. The majority of patients were on our GMED services, hospital medicine services, and we included our one family medicine service. We also found that 10.4% of all of our patients hospitalized here were observation. So one in 10 patients in our walls were outpatients. This was also studied um, by the Society of Hospital Medicine, and they, look at, they looked at 200, 2012 Medicare claims by provider type. And they found that hospitalists provided about 59% of observation care, and traditional inpatient and outpatient providers provided about 21%. So about 80% of patients were cared for by a generalist. So really, this is a general medicine population. I will also just point out that emergency medicine is up here, about 5%. I think we all think of emergency department observation units, and the ED was certainly first out of the gate in observation care. 
but really they provide an, a small amount of observation care now, and this really speaks to how observation has really creeped out of units and is really on the general medicine wards. So what kind of diagnoses do patients have? Well, the, the number one diagnosis has always been chest pain. But what really is observation? Well, observation is a billing distinction. It is actually not related to clinical diagnosis. Even though some diagnoses like chest pain are more common than others, any diagnosis can theoretically be billed as OBS. It's also not related to location in the hospital. You can deliver observation services in a unit, on a general ward, even in an ICU. And again, I will also say just for semantics, observation is not truly a status. We all use the term observation status, but it's technically a subset of outpatient status. But I think it's important to really call this what it is. Observation is an oxymoron. This I took from Google Dictionary, this, and the definition is a figure of speech in which apparently contradictory terms appear in conjunction. Google did not use my definition for an oxymoron, but I think they should. I think outpatient hospitalization really sums up the problems. When we're trying to call a hospitalization an outpatient stay, this really just doesn't make sense. So what are the problems we see with observation? Well, one is the observation oxymoron itself. How does one determine which hospitalized patients are outpatients? And again, another contradictory thing here, the illness of my daughter, Erin, with the expertise of her attending physician, that's a kind of a marked contradiction there. Well, what does Medicare say about observation? Medicare says that observation should last less than 24 hours, and in only rare and exceptional cases should observation last more than 48 hours. This paper was published in Health Affairs in 2012, and it looked at Medicare claims from 2007 to 2009, and on the y-axis is hours per observation episode. And you can see here that the observation length of stay increased from 26 to 28 hours over this time period. And kind of buried in this manuscript was a statistic that more than 10% of stays lasted greater than 48 hours. So I bring you back to what Medicare says about observation, that they should last less than 24 hours and rarely exceed 48 hours. Even in 2007, we knew that observation stays were, in, on average, lasting longer than 24 hours. And I would say that 10% of stays greater than 48 hours is not rare and exceptional. So to Medicare's credit, they recognized these long observation stays were a problem. And in 2013, they established the two midnight rule. And the two midnight rule was a regulation um, that CMS is issued for determining hospital status. And, and those of you that take care of inpatients know about the two midnight rule. I want to just make sure everyone's aware that this is different than Medicare's three midnight rule. The three midnight rule is actually law in the, in the original Medicare law, and it's uh, for determining post-acute skilled nursing facility eligibility. There's another important difference between the two midnight rule and the three midnight rule besides the obvious length of stay you can actually scoop and count outpatient time towards the two midnight tally. But for the purposes of the three midnight rule, outpatient time does not count. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a couple of slides. So we saw some immediate problems with the two midnight rule, despite CMS's good intention here. This is, again, a marked oversimplification. But say you have a patient that needs 40 hours of care for something like a pneumonia. If that patient gets ill at 2 a.m. on Thursday morning and needs 40 hours of care, they will discharge at 6 p.m. on Friday. If that same patient happens to get sick at 5 p.m. on Thursday, that 40 hours of care will carry them over to Saturday morning, which is a two midnight stay. So time of day a patient gets sick can impact their insurance benefits under the two midnight rule. And then of course, even ICU patients can be considered outpatients. Care that we would never consider safe in an outpatient clinic can now be billed as outpatient. So who are these patients? We've actually had them at University Hospital and other hospitals have as well. So patients that run out of their insulin, come in with DKA, maybe their pH is 6.95, we replace their electrolytes, their fluids, give them their insulin back. Those patients can get better very quickly. Severe intoxication or overdose, and then severe allergic reaction or anaphylaxis. Very sick, certainly not outpatient care, but patients that could be considered outpatients. The other problem is that other payers use different criteria, and one of the difficulties we face as providers is that we need to determine status when writing admission orders without necessarily knowing what criteria that patient's payer may use. So what does the Inspector General say about observation? Well, they did this report studying the fiscal year 2014 data, which was the first year under the two-minute rule, and they compared it to fiscal year 2013. 
And what they found was that there was an increase in hospital outpatient stays. There was a decrease in inpatient stays, so not good news. There were still three quarters of a million long observation stays, those exceeding two midnights, despite the two midnight rule, which was only a small decrease of 2.8%. There was a 6% increase in these non-qualifying three midnight stays for purposes of the skilled nursing facility benefit, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. And there was an average of over $200 in pharmacy costs um, per patient that was hospitalized under observation. So what about these non-qualifying skilled nursing facility stays? And I think this is a very important point. So as I mentioned, you can kind of scoop out patient time for purposes of Medicare's two midnight rule, but that time does not count for purposes of the three midnight rule. So here you have a patient that you put in as an inpatient right up front. They have three inpatient midnights. That's a qualifying stay for purposes of the skilled nursing facility benefit. What about this patient, though, where their first night is spent under observation, and then we write an order to change them? That patient still has three consecutive hospital midnights, but only two of them are inpatient midnights. That is a non-qualifying stay for purposes of the skilled nursing facility benefit. It does not make any sense, but this is how the law works. And so what do we know about observation care? Well, this is from MedPAC's report this March. And along the x-axis, you see fiscal year, and the y-axis, you see cumulative percent change. And this dashed line here is the growth in outpatient services. This solid line here is the decline in inpatient discharges. And so this is not all exclusively observation. This is all outpatient care. But clearly, you can see from this slide that there's a marked change in how our Medicare beneficiaries are covered in the Medicare program. Why has this happened? I'm just going to touch on this briefly. Um, basically, there was limited enforcement and surveillance of patient status, and there was a reimbursement differential. So hospitals were incentivized to place patients as inpatients. Congress realized that and issued a pilot in 2003, uh, this recovery auditor pilot. And this was a six-state, three-year pilot where auditors looked at cases that a hospital built inpatient that the auditors thought should have built outpatient, and they asked hospitals for that money back. And they got back $992 million. The flaw in this system was that the RACs were developed on a contingency fee system. So it was kind of an eat-what-you-kill model. The more the auditors audited and denied payment for, the more money they made. However, Medicare is an expensive program, and Congress recognized that there was money that was probably being misbilled here, and they rolled out the RAC program to all 50 states by 2010. And this just shows you the margin. This is from one of MedPAC's early reports, but you have the years 2002 to 2013 on the x-axis, and you have margin on the y-axis. And the solid line is the inpatient Medicare margin. This dashed line is the outpatient hospital margin. So even though both are negative, there's clearly a benefit for hospitals to build inpatient care. We did two studies in a collaboration with Johns Hopkins and the University of Utah, and I'm not going to talk about specifics of these papers, but basically what happened was RACs were denying aggressively and hospitals were appealing because they felt that their determinations were correct. And so what happened was in 2016, the Government Accountability Office reported a 2,000% increase in appeals of these claims from 2010 to 2014. And as of September of 2016, there was more than 600,000 cases awaiting adjudication at level three of the five-level appeals process. The ALJs, unfortunately, only had capacity to hear 92,000 of these cases a year. So assuming not a single new appeals case came into the system, it was going to take seven years to clear this appeals backlog. CMS has, has really scrambled to create some other solutions, and they've offered some settlement offers. But as of July of this year, the appeals backlog has only dropped to 444,000. So why does this matter? Well, audits are essential in the Medicare program, as unfortunately, fraud and abuse does exist. However, how this auditing program was set up has resulted in overzealous auditing. And the, I will say the RACs are the only Medicare contractors that are paid on a contingency fee system. All other contractors are paid to do a job. This has resulted in an appeals backlog, resulting in failure of due process for hospitals. So on the flip side, even though hospitals like ours appeal almost everything, many hospitals cannot. Hospitals might favor observation to avoid this appeals process that requires trained staff and will have dollars tied up for many, many years. Many hospitals can't do that, and so they have to default to observation, which has contributed to the increasing rate. The second problem with observation, obviously, is the cost for our patients, and I've already touched on both of these. And those of you that round on the fifth floor always see this oxymoron, the no, no storage of equipment or beds in this hall, always right next to the bed, which I love. 
So the skilled nursing facility benefit, um, there's two problems here. Number one is the mean length of hospital stay has shifted since Medicare was established. So in 1965, when the Medicare program was established, the mean length of stay for patients 65 and older was 14 days. Now it's closer to five days. So when you have a time-based definition for a benefit, like the, skilled, like the skilled nursing facility benefit, needing to stay three midnights, and the whole hospital landscape shifts, clearly fewer people are gonna qualify for that benefit. And then of course the rise in observation stays, which we've talked about, um, the Inspector General has also estimated that it costs more than $10,000 out of pocket for an uncovered skilled nursing facility stay following an observation hospitalization. And then obviously the cost of hospitalization for our patients. I won't go into all the specifics here, but just note that there was more than 350,000 outpatient hospital stays in fiscal year 2014 that exceeded the inpatient deductible. This was a 16% increase from the year prior. So how can we use health services research to change these policies? And these are five lessons I've learned. Well, number one is that data is important. And this was a, a time I was in Congress and I saw this sign and I, it made me laugh, but it's actually true. It says, in God we trust, all others bring data. But not just data, it needs to be data that applies to policy that our policymakers know what to do with and we can talk to them on their level. And I think this is where the Health Services and Care Research Program here is so critically important to helping change policy. This is a figure from the first paper we published from this data set on observation. And what we found studying this is that there was all sorts of definitions being used in the literature. And so we made a very transparent definition that other people could use and reproduce so there would be comparability of findings in the future. But one finding that we, when we, when we did a literature search is that a lot, of, uh, a lot of researchers were excluding these status change patients. Well, what about these status change patients? In this paper, we found that 47% of all observation claims had some status change, either observation to inpatient or inpatient to OBS. Clearly, you cannot exclude them and have valid results. So we came up with a definition on how we could incorporate them and how we can count those towards observation. Another finding was that 5% of all claims contained multiple different revenue center codes, indicating more confusion on how this was used on the billing and codings um, side of things. This was another paper that we wrote that actually was used by the Senate Finance Committee to draft an amendment to the Affirm Bill in the 114th Congress. Um, this, this bill did not pass, but it shows that our, our, our lawmakers are listening to what we're, we're producing for them as physician researchers. And then I'll just um, say this was an editorial I wrote with Representative Joe Courtney, who introduced the Improving Access to Medicare Coverage Act of 2017. And this bill would guarantee the skilled nursing facility benefit to any Medicare beneficiary staying three or more midnights, regardless of whether those were observation midnights or inpatient midnights. So a small step in the right direction. And I'll say this has bipartisan support. It actually has bipartisan support in our state. Um, but this was a really important, we called out this change in hospital length of stay as a problem and we called on the rise in observation stays as a problem and really that we needed to modernize the three midnight requirement. I'll say don't forget the regulatory side. This is CMS wine. Um, this, you can get this at Costco. So I think, thank my dad for introducing me to Costco. Um, it's not that good, but... Um, <laughs> It is there. Um, and I just think about things like the two midnight rule. Um, Medicare was able to change policy, even though I think the two midnight rule had some positives and negatives. This is a lot easier lift sometimes than creating a new law. I think this is probably the, the most recent thing I've recognized, that we need unique collaborators um, in health services research to translate our research into policy. So this was um, the House Ways and Means Health Subcommittee where I testified in 2014. Um, and I, I am here, and I guess I was terrified, and I looked terrified. Um, but I, I will just say the people that I met that day, um, so this is Toby Edelman, and I had actually met her about six months prior, but she also testified. She is a lawyer for the Center for Medicare Advocacy, and I'm now um, testifying as an expert witness on a Medicare beneficiary appeals case with her. This woman also testified with us. This is Amy Deutschendorf. She was a nurse administer, administrator from Johns Hopkins, and we, she's been the bridge to our collaboration with Hopkins. She's a senior author on this paper. We wrote this after we testified together. And this is Laura Allendorf. She was a lobbyist for the Society of Hospital Medicine at the time, and obviously we've done a lot of collaboration with SHM on this topic. 
So I'll just say, like, you have a lobbyist, a lawyer, a doctor, and a nurse in a hearing. It kind of sounds like a, it's starting of a knock-knock joke, but I think these are the people that really help bring this policy forward. Every single person on that panel really adds something to this conversation and is seeing this from a slightly different perspective and hopefully can help us get across the finish line in some reforms. And the last thing is to be persistent. We've written op-eds, we've written blogs, we've talked to any reporter who wants to put this into the mainstream media to keep the conversation going. UW Health has written letters um, on draft bills, written to our representatives. You never know exactly what is going to make the difference or to get some other person interested in this topic to help move policy issues forward. So I'll stop there and just say hospitalized patients can be inpatients or outpatients. Chest pain is the most common diagnosis, but any diagnosis can be under observation. I've talked about how observation is problematic for a number of reasons, but I really believe that we as frontline providers and researchers need to use health services research to impact policy. So thank you. I'll have Dr. Kine come up as well. Thank you very much, Doctors Kind and Sheehy. I just have to say one more thing. Is that okay? Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But I have to say none of this would be possible without an entire team from the Health Services and Care Research Program without funding, but particularly Dr. Page. We really wanted to thank you for all of your support for the program. This is Dr. Page's last grand rounds with us as our department, so I hope you will all join me in a round of applause thanking him for all he's done for our department. Um, that was outstanding. We have maybe three minutes for to to um, uh, to take questions, and then I need to close with just a couple comments. So I'll leave it to you. And please repeat the questions for the recording. Yes. Any questions? Yes. Uh, so the, the, this was more of a comment that the healthcare system itself drives its own spending, and certainly the tail wags the dog, doesn't it? So it is a challenge, that is certainly for sure. Um, I do think that we have uh, a need as a society to re-examine our processes and to think carefully about the outcomes of our stakeholders, our patients, our families, and not just one sub subgroup of those families, but the entire U.S. population. Uh, but I, I do think that this is something that we have to continue talking about as a field. And I hope if any, if any, if we've done anything today, it's a, it, it's encouraged you to get involved in these topics. You can make a difference. It, use your voices. Physicians, nurses, health professionals, we have more power than, than you may realize in places like Congress, places like policymakers, even reaching out to other stakeholder groups that you wouldn't necessarily think might be interested in health, but they very well might be. So, so please get out there and use your voices. Dr. Reese. Yes, so the question was, what about the correlation between the resources available within these communities and the disadvantage of the communities? Are, are there health centers, are there different infrastructure uh, like providers available within these most disadvantaged areas and what can we do to make that happen? 
Well, I think this is a topic worthy of uh, additional study for sure. Uh, from what I have seen in the field, I do not think there is a good alignment, to be honest with you. I think there's always opportunities for improvement. Metrics like this could make that possible because we can think about targeting of resources in new ways. When you have a metric that's available for the entire U.S. and Puerto Rico, suddenly it becomes very policy relevant. And you can think about using such um, metrics to target funding, to think about targeting um, incentives, to having different health care systems set up shop within these disadvantaged areas. But let me expand this beyond just our physician-centric thoughts here. Let's talk about social services too, thinking about Meals on Wheels, thinking about housing, thinking about some of the other processes that could be available. We're going to have to close there. Um, another round of applause for these phenomenal faculty members, please. This is a special day for me uh, because this is the day we announce our chief residents and their endowed positions within the department. So I just want to acknowledge every year we have phenomenal chief residents and this year is no exception. Uh, please stand, chiefs. Um, it's my last day to tell you what to do, so <laughs> do it. Uh, Brian Lewis is the um, Trowbridge uh, endowed chief resident. Uh, Matt Brunner, Ann Chidara, and Samantha Murray Boehner are the Bridges, Page, and Vogelman endowed chief residents. There's a little bit of academic money and support and just we all put this together a number of years back to acknowledge our chiefs. So turn toward the audience, please, and let's give them a round of applause. And we'll take, Dr. Vogelman couldn't be here today, but I couldn't be here after this. Uh, just in closing, um, uh, being your chair has been the greatest privilege academically of my life. And this is a phenomenal Department of Medicine. Keep coming to Grand Rounds. This is a tradition that goes back centuries. And it brings us together scientifically, professionally, personally. Um, and just in closing, thanks for the opportunity to serve. And we'll all stay in touch. Thanks again.